He starts out wanting to write a manual for how your ordinary Christian ought to approach Scripture, a help for them in reading the Bible. He starts off doing that because of the persecution that's taking place in France. He adds to that another purpose, which is to write an apologetic for the, the Protestant Christian faith. And as I mentioned before, his, his argument is that I'm, I'm simply upholding what Christians throughout church history have taught. And so that, that quoting of the church fathers demonstrating that he's familiar with the very sources that the Roman church is using to defend their position, that goes a long way in helping him to advance his argument. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, my, I, I had to stop for a second and think because obviously we take for granted that we have just have Bibles now. How, how many do you want? You know, I got, I got yeah. a few, I got a few hanging around, but there was a moment in time where it's like, Hey, here's, here's the Bible. And it's like, well, what do we do with this? Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's writing the Institute's like, well, let me show you what to do with this. But well, that was kind of the intention. That was his an oh initial goodness. intention. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's an incredible thought. That's it. Cause I was thinking, Oh, they have the same problem. Uh, they have the same problem back then that we have to do, have today. Like, no, it's a totally, it's a totally different problem. It's trying to solve a brand new problem. Essentially. We have, we have something very different. Yeah. We, we can't even imagine what that would be like not having access to a Bible. I mean, have there been writings about it? Cause now I'm super, now I'm super curious, like what it was like for, I don't know, men like Calvin or his era to be given their first copy of scripture and, and to be able to read it for themselves. Are there any accounts of, that's a sea change moment in human history. There are accounts of just the, the dramatic, the seismic shift that was, was created with it by the availability of the Bibles. Lindbergh ha has a book mm. that called the Protestant Reformations mm -hmm. that kind of goes through the story of all these events that are coming together pr to produce a, a time of, of great reform and kind of couched within that is reform within the Christian church. And that would be a, the Protestant Reformations by Lindbergh. That would be a good book, I think, to look at and just getting a sense of the magnitude of these shifts that are taking place in the world. So, so Calvin was a, a kind of a shy, quiet, retiring man. I saw that you quoted him in your introduction, who was going to you know keep to himself and 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 study law. Essentially, he was also yep. a, f a family man. And then, you know, he he gets scripture, reads it, and suddenly he f he feels or experiences this call to you know be outspoken in 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 the promotion and defense of this. And he steps he steps up to the challenge. He steps up to the challenge, yeah, and he, in, in a huge way, and just has a dramatic impact for. For Christ in his context, context, and and you know one of the things that the the magisterial reformers, and we we, we oftentimes distinguish between the magisterial and the the radical reformers. The magisterial mm -hmm. reformers were reformers who tried to seek reform in the context of while respecting the government officials that God had put into place, right? And and, and the <clears throat> the radical re reformers were more of an anarchist type of spirit. But the one of the things that was true of the magisterial reformers across the board is that they didn't limit kind of their understanding of what it meant to follow Christ and, and to, to even in, engage in the various controversies that were taking place at that time as they, they didn't see it as, as simply an intellectual discussion or even something or intellectual controversy or even something that was limited to the, the kind of religious sphere, mm -hmm. but they, they saw that it impacted every area of one's life. And so somebody, somebody like Calvin in Geneva was, was very much in, invested in trying to improve the conditions of, of just the lives of your ordinary citizen living there in Geneva. This is, this is amazing because I remember reading The Case for Christian Nationalism by Stephen Wolf, and he talks a lot, a lot about this but I hadn't put together the piece of the puzzle that it said they had just basically received scripture for the first time. And now men had access to the word of God to be able to begin thinking about these questions from that foundation, whereas they hadn't had that before. Naturally, mm. with that, we'll call it tool in their hands, they would begin thinking about things in a totally different way for the first time. I, I hadn't even, mm. I feel like I'm time traveling right now. <laughs> Yeah, it really did change everything. And for somebody like like Calvin or or a Luther, who who had been trained in the university, that they would have access to the Bible. But it would you know it, it would really only be the elites, yeah, somebody who could 
could, could afford or mm -hmm. somehow obtain a university education that would have that kind of access. Your, your, your common person just would not have access to scripture. And this is why you have the crisis of authority that kind of leads to this Protestant idea of sola scriptura, because they only, your common person only had scripture through the filter of their priest, who, you know, the, the, the person who is a, a member of the organized institutional church. Mm -hmm. And so they have no access on their own to, to scripture. And, and they, they have no opportunity to um, look at scripture and see if it lines up with what they're being told it says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the first time, for the first time they can really do that, man, I feel like a whole, a whole bunch of things are, are settling into, are settling into place right now. As I come to understand the, the magnitude of the Protestant Reformation, not just as a term that lives as like a, a flagpole in my mental picture of human history, but as the significance and the weightiness of the change, really everything, really everything did change mm. in, in ways that, um, are more than just the everyday average person can read scripture for themselves and they can challenge the authority structures, but it, it sort of becomes this radical new, not radical, definitely not that, but this, this new way to rethink about society independent of what, how authority had been understood beforehand. We do mm. what the church says because they're the church. It's like, well, hold on. It says right here in the book that uh, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But we, I don't know that we have a good picture of that today. No, it's, it's, I think it's, it's very difficult. I mean, we, we can only imagine what it would have been like to be alive at that time. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what, that's what I can't stop myself from doing. So, 